Let's talk about the most important blood work to check when it comes to your metabolic health. Our health boils down to our metabolic health, which at its core centers around something called insulin resistance, or if you want to think of it as insulin sensitivity. The longer someone has insulin resistance, the closer they are to developing all sorts of bad things like high cholesterol, high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, stroke, fatty liver disease, gout, and even things like dementia, and that includes Alzheimer's disease, as well as the 13 obesity-related cancers. This is why you want to make sure that your body is very sensitive to insulin so that you can prevent or at least mitigate all that bad stuff. So determining your level of insulin resistance is paramount, and you do that by checking fasting insulin levels. Now, it doesn't make sense to check insulin levels in those with type 1 diabetes because their pancreas does not make insulin. Same applies to those who have advanced type 2 diabetes, meaning people who take insulin for type 2 diabetes. But for everyone else, checking fasting insulin levels is the best way to determine someone's degree of insulin resistance. Unfortunately, most doctors are not checking these levels for various reasons. Maybe a patient's insurance plan won't cover it. Maybe there's a lack of familiarity there. Some will say that checking a hemoglobin A1C and a fasting glucose level are good enough in evaluating someone's degree of insulin resistance. But by the time those biomarkers are elevated, the body has already developed a lot of insulin resistance and thus poor metabolic health. So the idea is to see how much insulin resistance there is long before you get to that point. Insulin is the most important metabolic hormone and it's made in the pancreas. It then travels in the bloodstream and then binds to proteins in various tissues throughout the body. It tells the cells of those tissues to allow glucose into the cell because insulin binds to the protein receptor that's on that cell. And when insulin is doing this, it then basically is a way to allow for that cell to store energy and uh, in some cases grow that tissue. Now your body starts to become resistant to that insulin when your pancreas makes too much insulin over too long of a period of time, which causes things in the body to change. The proteins that bind insulin on the cells, they become downregulated, meaning there's fewer insulin receptors available to bind that insulin and those binding receptors become less and less functional, so they're not doing a good job of binding to that insulin that is floating around in the bloodstream. And too much of this ends up leading to prediabetes and metabolic syndrome, and if it's even more advanced, it eventually causes type 2 diabetes, heart disease, stroke, and a bunch of other health problems that I mentioned earlier in this video. So the American Diabetes Association, which I can't believe they say this, but they say that type 2 diabetes is an unremitting chronic disease with no treatment and no cure. Well, the truth is it can be treated and it can be reversed unless it's too far advanced. Simply giving people more and more insulin for their type 2 diabetes is far from ideal. There are ways to fix the problem by fixing the diet exercise, and in some cases with GLP-1 agonist drugs like Manjaro or Ozempic. In other words, we need to make our bodies more sensitive to insulin. Fasting insulin levels will change way before hemoglobin A1C levels and chronic elevations in glucose levels. So it's basically a much earlier way of detecting metabolic dysfunction. When someone has elevated insulin levels, the goal is to get that down so that you prevent all the bad diseases that stem from that poor metabolic health. Ideally, the fasting insulin should be less than 10, specifically less than 10 micro units per milliliter. The lower, the better. A marathon runner who eats healthy will have fasting insulin levels of two or three. I work out a lot and I eat pretty healthy. My fasting insulin level was 3.3. If you're above 15, you've got insulin resistance, and that's when I get very concerned with my patient's health. Insulin resistance is a hindrance to weight loss, and you actually can't lose weight until that insulin comes down because that insulin is constantly telling your fat cells to keep storing more and more energy. So you have to get insulin down any way you can. And there's basically four ways to do it. Diet, exercise, bariatric surgery, and GLP-1 drugs like Ozempic and Manjaro. For some people, they only need diet 
or diet and exercise to fix it. And obviously bariatric surgery is not that appealing because it's invasive and carries a lot of risk. With Ozempic and Manjaro, they do a wonderful job of lowering insulin, but not everyone wants to inject themselves once a week, let alone the price of those medications. Now, when it comes to your diet, you can get the insulin down simply by avoiding refined carbohydrates and added sugar. This is why there's a recommendation of eating less than 25 grams of added sugar and refined carbohydrates per day. So it's going to get your insulin down if you're able to do that. Eating fat does not make the insulin go up. When you eat protein and it's broken down into amino acids, those amino acids can make insulin go up a little bit, but you need amino acids because your body needs to make various types of proteins to keep you alive. But just like not all fat is created equal and not all carbs are created equal, well, not all amino acids are created equal. We all know that you need more protein if you're building muscle, especially those branched chain amino acids. So branched chain amino acids like leucine, isoleucine, and valine. And those amino acids make up 20% of muscle. So these BCAs, they're in high concentrations in corn products, especially leucine. So most tubs of protein powder at the health food store, those contain a lot of BCAs. If you're building muscle, you need them. But let's say you're not a bodybuilder and you consume too many BCAs. Well, then your liver will take those branched chain amino acids, cleave off the amino group, and then turn them into organic acids, which will then either be diverted into liver fat or they'll be converted into excess glucose. Now, either one of these processes will drive your insulin levels up. So both the type of protein that you eat and the amount of protein that you eat can impact what happens to your insulin levels. Beef and pork have high concentrations of BCAs, especially if they were corn fed. Now, the other important aspect to keeping your insulin levels low is to eat around 25 to 30 grams of fiber from real food every day. Most people consume less than half of that, around 11 to 15 grams per day. Um, so we're talking seeds, nuts, fruits, vegetables, beans, and other legumes, as well as whole intact grains. That's where you get your soluble and your insoluble fiber. Now, fiber has many functions and many benefits, one of which is slowing digestion and absorption and therefore reducing those insulin spikes.